nice, cool. Um, yeah, like Tone said, my name is Aaron, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about concept. It's not the same thing as the execution of a concept. So hey there. Um, yeah, so I'm principal designer at Booking.com, and just to give you guys a little bit of numbers and statistics since you're a data crowd, uh, Booking.com sells over one million room nights every single day, so we get a whole bunch of different traffic, uh, new people coming in every single day, and we also have over 1.3 million different types of accommodation online and instantly bookable, and we have over 120 million verified guest reviews, so those are big numbers, super awesome. Um, but in spite of the really awesome and flattering introduction that Tuan gave of me, I have a bit of a, a little confession, kind of like Hido had before, and it's actually that I'm a pretty large failure, probably a failure of even epic proportions, and you're probably wondering, why is this person coming on stage and saying, I make so many mistakes? Well, it's because it's true, and there's data to back me up on this. At Booking.com, we have uh, a failure rate of 9 out of 10. It's pretty shitty, isn't it? 9 out of 10. Um, and that means only one, one experiment out of every one that we try is going to end up, out of every 10 that we try, is going to end up actually making it into our customers' hands for any sort of long period of time. One of the reasons why our success rate is pretty low is because we've been optimizing and doing A-B tests, tens of thousands of A-B tests for the past 10 to 15 years now. So we've literally optimized the shit out of our entire website, the core experience. So <laughs> there's a million ideas, and everybody's tried a whole bunch of different ones. We've also got a pretty strict experimental creator. His name is Lucas Vermeer. Maybe you guys have seen him speak at other Conversion Excel events. Um, but we're pretty good at identifying false positives and we're very strict about writing hypotheses, making sure that we have predetermined end run times for our experiments. And we also know that 70 to 80% of the time, you're going to see some sort of sig significant result before the predetermined end run time, and especially if your sample size is pretty small. So we're kind of sticklers, and we don't just put stuff full on because we feel like it. No metrics whack-a-mole, as I like to call it. People see green, and they're like, I did it. And I'm like, no, that's not how, that's not how math works. So I like to sum up my career and the evolution of Booking.com as failing to succeed. And this is a very intentional double entendre, because uh, most of the time, we're just li like literally failing to succeed. Nine out of 10 times, we're just doing a crap job. However, we've managed to also fail our way to success. Right? And a number of the other speakers have been talking about the compound effect. But at Booking.com, over the course of the past 15 or so years that we've been doing A-B experimentation, we've managed to only keep the good business and user decisions. And these small incremental wins, and we've thrown away all the bad decisions. So imagine like what your life or what your business would look like and how much growth you could achieve, to, both personally and professionally, if you only had good decisions behind you. So if you're interested in learning more about the compound effect and not only how it's good to grow your business and keep the small incremental gains to see exponential results over the course of a long period of time, I suggest that you check out this short, nice read, uh, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. So it's pretty nice, inspirational little book there if you're interested, if you like reading. So yeah, I've run a lot of experiments. I think Hito put that last slide in there, like 10,000 or more experiments if you work at Booking.com. In the past four and a half years, I've run about 1,200 experiments from concept generation the whole way through technical implementation because all of our designers and developers actually go in and code our experiments from scratch. We don't have drag and drop interfaces. You have to go in and sift through it yourself. Um, so with all, of that ex with all that experience, and all of that failure, if you do the math, preferably you don't do the math on how many things actually succeeded, um, I must have learned something, right? I mean, otherwise, what am I getting paid for? Uh, but yeah. So I'm glad that you asked what I learned. Um, at Booking.com, because we've been testing for so long, when I first started, and when we get like 100 new starters every month, you often hear people giving great ideas finding user problems and user research and saying, oh, we should test this concept. We should really test this thing or solve this problem for users. 
And the people that had been there for a really long time would just almost regurgitate immediately, oh yeah, 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 we've, we've tested that, it failed, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work. So you'd see these new enthusiastic energ energetic people come in with their great ideas and then kind of get shot down. So I like to call bullshit on that because it is not a concept that typically fails in my personal experience. It is the execution of a concept that typically fails. So good ideas are good ideas and user problems don't cease to exist simply because you haven't found the correct solution or execution in that amount of, in, in your previous attempts. So I armed myself with a laundry list of really annoying questions to ask people when I found out that they had tested something that I was really interested in, in learning more about. Um, one of the first questions I asked was, OK, cool, I'd love to see the data. How did it change user behavior? Uh, do you still have the code anywhere? Would, you know, were there any usability tests done? Um, just digging in and getting as much information about the execution that had proven uh, false. Or was it negative? Because you know? sometimes if you see a negative result, that's actually better than seeing an insignificant result, because at least you're messing with something that you know people care about, right? So working at Booking, I learned that there are far more ways to fail at this, at, at, at conversion optimization, than there are to succeed. And one of the reasons is the very specific environment that we're working in, because our product is built and translated into over 40 languages. And a word that in Japanese is maybe two characters long is 50, 60 characters long in, say, Russian or something. So layouts break, and every time somebody writes a translation, that's another point of possible failure. Uh, same thing with the currencies. We support over 50 different types of currencies. So something that's maybe two characters long in US dollars or euros could be 15 characters long in Colombian pesos. So I always browse booking.com in Russian and Colombian pesos if you ever want to see a shit show of a design. It's craziness. And of course, we've been building on top of 20 plus years of spaghetti code, as we like to call it. Um, so it's just, there's way more points of possible fa failure than you can possibly imagine. So what should you do if you come to a company or you start doing conversion optimization at a place that tends to be a little bit mature and you find that really good concepts have failed? The first thing I always do is dig in to the technical implementation because I really don't trust that people are doing things right. I don't know what that says about me. Don't psychoanalyze. I'd rather do stuff myself. <laughs> so I just try to see like, when the experiment was turned on, did it increase any errors or warnings? Was there perhaps corrupt data? Maybe there was some kind of recommendation algorithm that wasn't well-trained enough and wasn't giving great enough recommendations yet. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can check into the kind of unseen reasons that tests fail. Another more obvious one that I'm sure many of you have already probably experienced is unintentional increases in page load time. Myself, being a designer, about five years ago, I loved a big hero image, you know? I was all about fancy CSS animations, and I really loved um, custom web fonts. All of these things I thought were super awesome. Um, but yeah, I've learned, I've learned better now. Uh, so I always take a look, did the experiment accidentally or unintentionally increase page load time that people just won't put up with? Because people want more information, but they certainly do not want to wait for it. So here's a personal example of a time that I messed up and then eventually redeemed myself at the end. OK, so a little context. When I first started at Booking.com, I was designing and developing our tablet website, so our T. website if you're using an Android, like a Samsung device or an iPad. And it was right around that time that Apple started to release the Retina quality screens. So I was doing a usability test in our usability lab in Amsterdam, and I was watching a man go through the search results. And a very seemingly innocuous behavior uh, really just led me to an insight, which ended up with pretty good gains. He zoomed in on the photograph on his brand new retina quality device, and he got a disgusting eye full of pixels. And I was ashamed, because it was terrible. What a poor user experience. So I thought to myself, 
OK, I'm going to fundamentally improve the, qual uh, the photo viewing experience. I always love using these little pointers, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> so if you look here in the left-hand side, that was base. And it's like really poorly cropped. And I think the overall width of the image was about 120 pixels, which is the actual width of the container that it was in. So in order to make an image retina quality, what you typically do is you double or triple the size of the image and then shrink it down with background size. So what I thought to myself is, OK, I'm going to take a 300 pixel wide image. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be beautiful and crisp. And nobody with a retina device will ever have to experience that pain again. And I used a tricky line of CSS um, with background size cover so that it would be better cropped. And then it would also always cover the size of the container. So that way, if this information over here would grow, you would get to see fundamentally more of the picture clearer. And then I also got rid of this worthless little piece of like, border here, because people wanted to see more of the picture. So I was ready to have a win. You know, I felt it. I knew it. It was based on user research. So I ran the test. And after the predetermined runtime run was over, I saw that there was just an insignificant result in the end. So of course, I got really upset, because I feel things very deeply. And I noticed, I started to dig into the data, because the analysis process is really important. And I noticed that I was like, bounces were crazy off the, off the charts. So many bounces. And I realized that it was because I increased the page load time by like two seconds. I'm like, uh, so yeah, don't tell my manager that either. So, but I did notice when I dug into it a little bit more that the people that didn't bounce and managed to stick around got further through the funnel. They were ending up on the, on the booking process and they were ultimately converting more. So I was like, hmm. So I messed it up in one way, but seemed to make it better in a slightly different way. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna take a step back from what I consider to be the ideal solution and make it slightly better by only increasing the size of the photos by maybe 200 pixels. So I re-implemented it just with that one little change, and I saw that there was a negligible impact on page load time the next run, and sure enough, green uh, conversion went through the roof. It was super awesome. But in the same way that I say execution is super important, we were trying to exp uh, basically export this concept onto our MDOT website. So I passed it off to another designer, and I said, here's what you got to do. You got to use you know, this right size of the image, and then you have to make sure that you use background size cover. And I gave him very specific instructions. He started the experiment. It ran for two weeks, and it was flat. So of course, because I'm very picky, I went in, and I checked his code. And I said, aha, you didn't use background size cover. So people weren't getting the really nice, um, the, the cropping wasn't improved. So after I fixed his slightly off, uh, execution, sure enough, conversion went through the roof again. So maybe I'm telling you to not trust your colleagues. Sorry. <laughs> this is like an underlying theme that I should have thought about before I started talking. Anyways, um, but this just goes to show that the invisible stuff that people don't really notice or look at very often impacts the user experience just as much as the visible. So as designers, if we're going to be well-rounded, we have to look into the data and understand things like errors and warnings and events and corrupted data and page load time. Another thing that we have to consider at Booking.com is all of the edge case bugs because of the stuff like having so many translation errors or so many currencies or, and just the crap code base that we have. There's lots of ways to mess up. So when I see something's not performing as well as I think it should, I start digging into all of the demographic data that we have, just trying to learn as much as I possibly can. So I go from, like, I go from using data to confirm a hypothesis into translating it into exploratory data analysis to run a follow-up test. So I say, oh, well, how did this impact landing traffic? What about new users? What about returning visitors? What about people who are seeing the site in right-to-left languages? Because oftentimes, Western designers don't implement things flawlessly in a right-to-left language. What about different user groups? So at Booking.com, we look at solo travelers, family travelers, business travelers, leisure travelers. We're able to segment in a whole bunch of different ways to see how the experiment impacted people. And also mobile devices. If you have a responsive website, you should be able to know exactly how it's impacting different browser types and different devices. And I could go on and bore you with a long list of questions, but I'll stop there and keep going. Um, so 
One of the reasons that we work like this and why we release every single line of code in an experiment is because it fundamentally helps us make our development super fast. Because if every bit of code is being released basically in a little protective container, that means we're able to roll out more. And when we're able to roll out more, like every single day, then we're able to start more experiments, which means we're learning faster. And if we're learning faster, then we're minimizing our business risk because we're not releasing uh, potentially bad code. We're throwing away the bad decisions faster and we're keeping the good de decisions even faster. So and also at the end of the year, we have a whole bunch of business data and experiments that we can analyze to have a more clear picture of exactly how we've improved our product or not improved our product over the course of the past year. Um, so I'm going to give a little example here. Uh, this is, again, a user research video of some, how do I do this? This is, is there a computer? Can somebody hit play? Well, actually, yeah. hold on one second. So I'll give you context. Again, I'm a designer on the tablet website team. I'm in South America, and there's this lovely woman who comes in with her own iPad device. And I see that she's looking at the desktop website on her tablet device, which means she hated what I was doing so bad that she actually went and found a link somewhere that took her to the desktop version. So it was like this lady put a knife through my heart. And I was like, that's it. Take my salary. Clearly, I'm failing. I'm slightly dramatic. So anyways, that's the, so I needed to get to the bottom of this. What sucked so bad that she took action to not have to see the stuff that I was doing? And go. There should be sound. Yeah. So they just asked her to go to find booking.com because they wanted her to navigate to the home page because we had an idea of what might be the problem, but I want to see if you guys can figure it out. So she's now pointing to a link that says Pantaya Principal. And she said, what, is, what do you think this, what is this link here? And she said, that's the link, that's the home page, Pantaya Principal. So she said, okay, great. And it was at that moment that I almost fell off of my chair. I was like, wow. Like, I finally figured it out. She doesn't hate me. This is not a personal attack against me. Does anybody, who speaks Spanish? Cool. Pantaya Principal, how would you, what would you think that meant? The principal screen. So if you tapped there, what do you think would happen? That you would be going to the home page, right? Any normal person would think that because it was translated incorrectly, right? So I was super happy because I didn't do something terrible. And I started to look through all the other languages, the ones that I kind of understood, like Norwegian and, 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 and Swedish. And they said things like hemsidum, which again, home site. So the base of our website actually had a poor translation baked into it. And we didn't find it until we started doing some user research. So at booking.com, we love a good five-minute experiment. So I thought to myself, I can either bug 45 different translators to get this tag to be fixed, or I can have a little bit of confidence for once in my life and assume that I have done a decent job optimizing the tablet website, and I just removed it. So, um, and then I just tracked it. So everybody who went to the website, the, the variant was no link. You had no way to get to the desktop website. And then after a certain period of time and a certain number of visitors, tens of millions of visitors, we saw a positive increase in conversion because people were no longer having the bad experience of tapping on that link, thinking that, that they were going back to the home page, when in actuality, we kept them on the exact same page but put them to the desktop website. So just a small reduction in friction for a whole bunch of people around the world ended up really improving our conversion rate. So this is just a shout out to all the user researchers here. Who's, who's your user research? Anybody? OK, yeah, yeah, nice, nice. We need more user researchers here. That's a lesson we should take from this. So another thing that could have potentially gone wrong here is uh, a noisy tracking. So that experiment example that I just gave you had my quick five minute dirty sort of implementation not had worked, I would have then gone in and implemented JavaScript on view tracking just to make sure that um, the people around weren't making enough statistical noise to drown out 
the people that were actually being impacted that, by that behavior. So sometimes if you know that you can refine tra uh, tracking, I usually try to go for the most impact and the most, uh, the most traffic, but then I usually follow up by refining the tracking just a little bit. Low traffic, this seems to be a problem with a lot of agencies or smaller countries. Um, but yeah, this is just, we don't really have this problem very much, but when we do, yeah. <laughs> kind of insane how many people we get. We don't really have this problem very much, but when we do, we take bigger, bolder steps, and the size of the step needs to correlate with the amount of traffic that you do. So instead of making one little change, we just go all the way and do, do something really drastic to try to see an impact. Another thing, poor design choices. Design is extremely powerful. Um, let's play a little game. Who can spot the difference? If you see the difference, put your hand up. So far, nobody. Something seemingly insignificant. Yes, what is it? The font for the price? Any specific one, the red one or the blue one? The blue one, yes. Nice, way to go. Yeah, so in this little ditty of an experiment, again, I was working on the tablet website, and uh, I was looking on retina screen devices and old devices and stuff, and I, I noticed I noticed something weird. Um, but anyways, so what, which one do you think did better? So what we're looking at is, again, I'm going to use this. Right here, we've got a sans serif font, Helvetica or Arial. And over here, we've got a serif font called Times New Roman. So if you put these two things together in an experiment, which one do you think is going to do better? Who thinks the top one? Look at this groupthink mentality. Nobody wants to raise their hand first. OK. Well, OK, so we've got like three people over there that thinks the top one worked. Who thinks that the second one worked? And now the groupthink kicks in. People see they get a little bit more confidence. To all the independent three thinkers over there, you have won today's prize of being right. The top one actually won. So what I had noticed browsing through the tablet website is that this font was different. And I thought, Times New Roman, that's super weird. Why is everything else Helvetica and sans serif when, and then this, own, this little thing over here is written in Times New Roman? Knowing what I know about typography, that's not super legible on screen, especially in non-retina devices, because you've got those little lines on the end of it, and the X height is much less um, legible on screen reading. So you'd use something like Times New Roman for newspapers, for example. So what I did was I said, OK, I think I can increase the legibility of this price here by improving the quality of the type and making it more consistent with everything else that's around it. Five minute experiment, and it went full on, super awesome, really simple. Um, but it just shows you seemingly insignificant design details have a profound impact on how people continue to use your site. Because that one little change, I could see a whole bunch of behavioral shifts in the data as I went through it. Anyways, here's a little tip for you guys to take home to your team so everybody thinks you're a genius. System fonts are awesome, and we should love them. They're to be celebrated. And why do I love system fonts? Because you basically have your own team of really talented typographers working to make your website super legible. So they, have ten, they tend to support all the different, uh, the, the different character sets, and they look at things in different languages. They're really picky about the kerning and all that kind of stuff. And they're specifically developed for on-screen reading. And when I say system fonts, I mean things like Blink or uh, San Francisco UI on your iPhone device, or let's say Roboto for an Android device. So just using what's baked into the device itself. Um, and it also reduces cognitive load, because people don't like context switching, going from serif to sans serif, a fancy brand font to something else. But designers and marketers love their brand fonts, but I'm telling you, it's typically not worth it. What I suggest you guys do is go to booking.design in your browsers and read an article about, um, about system fonts that our director of design, Stuart Frisbee, has written, because it's super awesome. And it gives you some tips and code snippets that you can use. But the fundamental learning that he got from a series of experimentation around system fonts is that the performance hit that comes with loading external web fonts always negates the benefits of improved type. 
So you think you're increasing legibility, but again, the on-scene has just as big as an impact as the scene, and it totally negates any potential gain that you could have had there. So go experiment with, with system fonts. Um, another thing is, again, love your user researchers and your usability testers, because I never, like, I, anytime I see sliders, if you want your experiment to fail, just put a slider in it. Um, nobody ever uses them, and if they do, they can't. They're really hard. So just basic usability principles. Also, I love, I love icons, but I also love a good text label. There's nothing more clear than a good text label. So don't let designers just take all the words off your website, because that's super not useful. But what happens if perhaps you have a really great concept, and you try a couple of different implementations, and it just happens that you're ahead of the curve? You know, the world doesn't move as fast as you do, and they don't read all the articles that you do. Do you guys remember this, this little experiment here? Do you remember that? Have you been paying attention? Yeah? OK, cool. Because I just talked about it maybe like 10 minutes ago. Um, so with this little experiment, a new designer joined our team not too long ago, and they read a blog post that I wrote on Booking.Design about how I failed in the first implementation of this concept. And he thought to himself, actually, you know what? Some time has passed. It's a really good idea. More people own retina screen devices now. I'm just going to re-execute that experiment. I'm going to try it with a higher quality image now. So he ran the experiment with a 300 pixel wide photo, and wouldn't you know it, it actually worked. I was just years ahead of my, of my time, right? So it's like you're it's just, you know, delayed. It's like right with a delay. So I take gratification in that. So yeah, new technology happens. People buy new devices. The hardware gets more powerful. I once implemented a line of CSS that was secretly crashing people's browsers. But I, like that was like four years ago. Um, but I have a feeling that if I implemented it today, it might be fine because devices are better, right? So stuff like that happens all the time. And also faster internet. So the page load time when somebody re-implemented this experiment that I had tried was actually negligible because people didn't notice it because they had better Wi-Fi. So what we have to remember as product designers and developers and marketeers is that our products need to evolve just as fast as people do, right? But I don't, I don't say faster than because then we're missing out on a couple of years when we could have been giving them the experience that was in line with what they were ready for. So do some testing, you know, know what you think is the ideal scenario, but step in line, develop in line with what your users are capable of handling at the moment. Um, another thing is the world is a super dynamic place, so things that failed a couple of years ago at Booking.com, like implementing swiping gestures on a photo gallery on a mobile website, now all of a sudden are working because people are trained by native apps to, to, to have some of these more sophisticated gestures, right? Things like tab bars are now making their way into mobile websites, which would have failed a long time ago. Um, people are using small screens now. They're learning new mental models and different design patterns. Um, but yeah, you're, and another thing to consider is that your own product probably changes on a daily basis. At Booking.com, we have so many iterations of our website, it's like there's as many stars in the sky as there are uh, <laughs> versions of Booking.com. So the context around all of the experiments that you're running are fundamentally changing as the time goes by because people evolve and your products also evolve. So what did you guys learn today? You learned some stuff? Well, I'll summarize it for you just in case you weren't paying attention. Um, first thing that you should do when you find out that a really awesome idea that you had failed was look into the technical implementation. See if you can blame some developers, right? Look into some edge case bugs. Check out the demographic data to see if perhaps you're not giving a high quality experience to a subset of your users. Check out to see if you can refine the traffic a little bit to, to make sure that you're hearing the signal from the users that are most impacted by your test. If you have low traffic, maybe be a little bit bolder. Have slightly more confidence in your ideas and make a bigger change. Are you perhaps working with not an awesome designer and they're doing things like having not enough contrast between the background and the text, kind of like what um, uh, Un was showing? Um, so things like accessibility and usability are super important. Or if they've added a slider, just say, nope, we need to do better than that. Uh, and what happens, and just remember that sometimes 
you're right with a delay, and the idea could be slightly ahead of its time. So please don't be afraid to go back and retry some ideas with a slightly different execution, or even the exact same execution a couple of years later. So remember, laugh heartily, make many mistakes, dig into the data, and eventually you'll learn how to execute flawlessly. That's it. That's what I got. Thank <music> you.